but it does mean we're going to have to be tough and we're going to have to prepare to suffer for the sake of being faithful. That's something that the American church can't stand to hear, but that's something that when I was traveling throughout the former communist countries, talking to people who stayed, Christians who stayed behind and, served, and uh, lived as dissidents, that's something I heard from them over and over again. Go back to America and tell American Christians, if you're not prepared to suffer, your faith is meaningless. Join the best in the movement. It's Conservative Conversations with ISI, educating for liberty since 1953. Welcome back. You're listening to Conservative Conversations with Johnny Burtka and Marlo Slayback. Today's guest is Rod Dreher, who is a senior editor at The American Conservative. A veteran of three decades of magazine and newspaper journalism, he has also written three New York Times bestsellers, Live Not By Lies, The Benedict Option, and The Little Way of Ruthie Lemming, as well as Crunchy Cons and How Dante Can Save Your Life. Thanks for joining us, Rod. It's so great to be here and to see friendly faces. Johnny and I used to work for, with each other. Actually, I worked for him. He was my <laughs> slave driving boss, our, my big cheese <laughs> office master. <laughs> <laughs> well, we appreciate you uh, joining us, despite the, the the time difference between um, the East Coast and Budapest. So we're excited to to speak. And before we get to the interview, um, we would just like to thank you, listeners, for listening to Conservative Conversations. This podcast is a production of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute, and our mission is to educate for liberty. If you would like to help us to, in pursuing that mission, please rate and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts to help us reach more listeners like yourself. Rod, well, uh, just to, to start off with, with us working together and some of the history there, I always used to think it was amusing when we would go to these events, and I had just become the executive director of TAC, and I was, you know, 28 years old and looked like I was 18 years old, and uh, everyone would know who you are, and they probably didn't know exactly who I was, and then you would introduce me to everyone as, and here's my boss, Johnny Burtka, and, and everyone would always be like, um, there would be a moment of confusion and then laughter. So I, uh, I always appreciated that. <laughs> um, but let's maybe get started with the Benedict Option. I know you've talked about it probably a million times at this point. Uh, but when the Ben Op came out in 2017, when you wrote the book, uh, you were anticipating, you know, a Hillary Clinton election victory. Um, I think it's safe to say that the state of the country in terms of the culture war, the way in which the left has really radicalized over the last five years, it was, it was nothing like what we see today. Um, so you were coming up with this strategy for uh, perhaps disengaging or at least just taking a step back from the political world to focus on building up and strengthening uh, local institutions in case we had to, to wait out you know, some hard times. Uh, but in the past few years, uh, I'm curious, you know, if your views have evolved at all um, since you wrote the Benedict Option, especially in light of, of seeing what is politically possible in states like Florida with governors like Ron DeSantis and in places like Hungary with uh, Viktor Orban, uh, where you are now living uh, and seeing actually the harmony that can exist between uh, conservatives fighting for the common good and and uh, the political. <laughs> so I'm wondering if we could start there. Yeah, no, thanks for the question. I, uh, you know, I the question I still get five years after the Benedict Option came out is people saying, people who haven't read the book are still saying, well, uh, we know you said head for the hills, but I'm not doing that. I'm like, dude, read the book. I didn't say head for the hills, nor did I say to completely disengaged from politics. I just called for a rebalancing. I said in the book, and I still believe this, that um, conservatives, social and religious conservatives, have to stay involved in politics, if only to protect religious liberty. And as you've said, Johnny, and I'll get to this in a second, I've come to appreciate more what can be done uh, if you get good politicians in place. Um, what I said in the book, and again, I still believe this, is that people who are Christians, and I wrote this for Christians, but it also... The book has found an audience among Orthodox Jews and even among some American Muslims. I've said that uh, if we are going to hold on to our faith and the values that drive us, we are going to have to step back a bit from the public square. And this whole winsome approach that a lot of our evangelical friends have taken, it doesn't work anymore, not in this negative, hostile, anti-Christian world we're living in. Um, and I, I've met a guy a couple of years ago, a pastor, a Protestant pastor from Portland, Oregon. This was during the summer of Floyd. I met him in Nashville. We were at the same conference. 
And he said, oh, you're the Benedict Option guy. Well, when your book came out in 2017, a lot of us heard it, heard about it, some of us read it, and we said, that guy's being alarmist. He said, now in Portland, we're living the Benedict Option. He said, we went in just three years, this was you know under Trump as the, the left really got wound up. He said, we went in three years from being uh, like the nice local Christian weirdos as far as Portland was concerned, to be in the devil's own servants. He said, we didn't change, the atmosphere changed. So the bent up is still important. But as you say, Johnny, I, I have learned, especially from being in Hungary, where, as you said, I now live, I start coming over here um, in 2021 uh, on a fellowship at the Danube Institute. And uh, I saw what could be done with a certain kind of conservative in power. And I'm talking about Viktor Orban. The thing that astonished me first about coming to Hungary is how very different this country is from the way our media and the Washington establishment, including many in the conservative establishment, say it is. I thought it might be some sort of repressive autocracy. It's not. It feels like America did around 1995, you know, before we went berserk. Uh, I ended up uh, texting our, our friend Tucker Carlson and said, hey, man, you got to come over here and, and see this place. It is not what they say, and there's actually some really interesting conservative things going on over here. Tucker did come later that summer, and he really changed the conversation around Hungary among American conservatives. I keep telling my conservative friends in America that we American conservatives need to learn from Viktor Orban. And it's not that you can pick up you know, the Fidesz party platform and plug it into America. Our country, uh, America, is very, very different from Hungary. But here's the key thing about Orban. Here's a politician who is a populist, but he understands what so many of our American conservative politicians don't, that real power is exercised with the NGOs and within the institutions of civil society. And uh, in the world we're in today, the left controls almost all of those, certainly at the international level and at the national level in the U.S. And so a, an effective populist conservatism has to be willing to fight back uh, on that playing field. This is why he's he's gone so hard against George Soros, because he sees that Soros, the multi-billionaire, throws his fortune into trying to undermine conservative governance, governance in Hungary and in the other Visegrad countries, and he's not having it. But I would like to see as our American conservative politicians get a lot more aggressive, as Ron DeSantis has done in Florida uh, with woke capitalists, for example. That's a very, very Viktor Orban move that DeSantis has done, and I think it's great. We need to have more American conservatives coming over here to Hungary and learn from Orban. So uh, you mentioned, um, you know, just on that note, I was actually in Hungary a few years ago for, um, I was reporting on um, the, this conference about the persecution of Christians that was held in Budapest, so uh, Viktor Orban was speaking there. And what they were actually doing, the Hungarian government, was instead of, you know, opening up Hungary for immigration from um, countries like Iraq, which were absolutely, the, the Christian population was absolutely just decimated after the, the war. Um, and uh, there, instead of, you know, just opening it up for mass migration, like a lot of other European countries did, especially surrounding um, Hungary, was they were going straight to the source. So kind of um, eschewing a lot of the other bureau the bureaucratic hurdles that um, you know other countries may have to go through like such as using the UN as kind of the vessel for um, improving conditions for Christians um, but more you know more generally for all populations in these countries and they were giving resources straight so like in Iraq rebuilding churches but also providing um, other types of resources to make sure that those populations stay there. Um, yeah, they which, rebuilt you know, an entire village, entire yeah, exactly. Christian village. Right, absolutely. And, you know, being that my, my family still lives in Syria, it's kind of, you know, you want them in a safe area, but you also think, well, that's, that's they've been there for since, you know, since like Christ walked the earth and um, you don't want them to leave behind all, all those years of just, mm -hmm. that's their home, right? Um, so that was a really interesting approach to me that um, the Hungarian government took because um, just what I've heard from the on you know pr priests that have visited my own family is the UN isn't effective. Um, no. there, there, there's just so much corruption there. Um, so I'm interested in hearing kind of ways that you think um, because the US is so kind of uh, centralizes these types of um, international efforts around these bureaucratic 
um, organizations that, um, you know, there's a lot of red tape involved, et cetera, how you think that that model can be emulated, not just in that particular example, but generally mm -hmm. speaking, like in what ways could that possibly be replicable in the U.S. where um, the conditions are just so much different? Yeah, how you yeah. That work? Well, it, it, as you probably know, I think you and I were at that same conference. Uh, okay. Uh, I, that's one of the first times I came to Hungary. Um, and side note, uh, after the conference was over, I was a speaker there too, if it were talking about the same conference. And uh, the, they took us to meet with the prime minister, Orban afterwards, all the speakers. There were about 19 of us, and I thought it was going to be just sort of, uh, we go shake his hand, got our picture taken, off we go. Victor Orban sat there with all of us in, for an hour and a half and answered all of our questions in good English. I was sitting right next to the Melkite Bishop of Mosul. And he was almost in tears thanking Orban for saving his life because the Hungarians gave him citizenship here so he because he was on a hit list right and and for helping his people hungary has a cabinet level office founded by Viktor orban called hungary helps the focus is almost entirely on helping christian refugees and persecuted christians around the world they as you know they've spent a lot of money and their resources in iraq and uh, in the places where christians have been decimated I don't know, Marlo, that we could do that in America, in part because our elites are so willfully indifferent to the fate of Christians, even though we are supposedly a majority Christian nation. One thing I found out talking to people, both in the governmental and private sectors who are working on with persecuted Christians, is that all of the international and especially the Western agencies don't care about what's happening to Christians. I talked to one guy who was desperately trying to get a senior uh, ambassador for a major Western European nation to help the, uh, defend the Christians in Nigeria who were being massacred by Muslims. And the guy, I was, my, my interlocutor said, I was trying to tell him, this is religious persecution. Don't you see they're massacring these Christians because they're Christians. And the Western ambassador was absolutely certain that no, 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 this is climate change. So this is the sort of thing that we're up against, that uh, the Hungarians are not ashamed to be Christian. They're not bigoted. I mean, they here in, in Budapest, where I'm living, uh, the government gives a lot of money to support Jewish life here and, and other religious minorities. But they're not afraid to be Christian and not ashamed to be Christian and not at all ashamed to recognize that as a historically Christian country, they have an obligation to help their fellow Christians who are persecuted around the world. I, all I can see right now from the American, uh, the American side is that uh, the private sector has to do it. Rod, a question for you. There's a, a number of things that popped in my head as you were talking, and I think at some point it would be uh, nice to probe sort of the, uh, the um, you know, the political thought or the political theology of Rod Dreher and, and uh. see exactly... Where, where you stand, but maybe before we get there, um, you had mentioned earlier on about sort of the win why the the uh, the winsome approach of uh, many evangelical leaders is no longer suited for the moment or perhaps failed. And I'm, I'm kind of thinking back to maybe the the you know early to mid aughts uh, where you had figures like Tim Keller. And I, and I say this with no disrespect to any of these these people, but, you know, you have Tim Keller's ministry in New York City. Uh, you have people like uh, Arthur Brooks at the American Enterprise Institute. This is probably during the Obama years. And he's a Catholic, but I think, it, you know, it's fair to say he embraced that winsome approach. Um, and, you know, uh, someone like David French. And you could see how all of these, you know, uh, people have, you know, shifted uh, as time has gone on, um, not necessarily in their personal convictions, although that may be true in some instances, uh, but you can see how the moment has, has really changed from where they were kind of operating in the, the mid aughts into the early 2010s. And I'm curious if you think that that approach of, of sort of being winsome, you know, having a seat at the table at the New York Times or in these other kind of institutions of cultural power, kind of being the token Christian or the token conservative. A another sort of uh, friend of yours, I know David Brooks, right, at the New York Times. This approach was pretty mainstream and kind of held up as, as the ideal for Christian political mm -hmm. and cultural engagement. 
and I'm wondering, you know, was it um, the wrong strategy to begin with, or was that really the right strategy for the time? And now that things have gotten so aggressively bad in the opposite direction, we just need a new approach. Have, have you processed this? And how have you thought about some of your friendships with with these people when when things have really changed or you might find yourself on the different in a different camp? Yeah, yeah, that's the big question, there, Johnny. I um, I don't know that I can say that the approach was wrong back in the day, because, look, I, I, there are certain very combative Christians, I think, especially among certain Reformed Christians. There are some very online Catholics and very online Orthodox who are very combative and tend to think that jerkiness is next to holiness. And that's just not Christian. At the same time, I, I, I think it is an, an immense temptation for Christians who are in our broad circles, that is to say, working in the media, working for in, in the Washington establishment and so forth in big business, to think that if we just show people around us that we're nice people, we're not haters, that they'll change their mind and they'll be nice to us. I wish that were true. It's not true anymore. Just uh, the other day, I noticed that a friend of mine, Tish Harrison Warren, she's uh, a conservative Anglican priest. Uh, she's in one of the conservative Anglican offshoots that has women priests. She is one of the most winsome, naturally winsome people I know, just incredibly kind and, and gentle and generous. She wrote a piece for the Times. She has a regular column in the New York Times. She wrote a piece talking about gay marriage and religious liberty and uh, and how we can find we can find a way to coexist together it was just it was chef's kiss marvelous and and kind and every every good thing you can possibly say man the comments under that they finally had to shut it down the left just ate her alive they if she had been jerry falwell circa 2005 she would not have been treated worse than she was treated as a kind person now, I don't think commentators on the New York Times necessarily represent everybody on the left, but I think that uh, Aaron Wren, the, uh, the Presbyterian uh, public intellectual, is absolutely right. We live in a time now and have been for the past few years where to be a faithful Christian, uh, a small o orthodox Christian, especially on matters of sexuality, puts you uh, in the bigot zone. Uh, there is simply no way that you are going to be able, that we are going to be able to be tolerated by these people. Just last week, Johnny, I was in uh, Ephesus in, uh, in Asia Minor, in Turkey today, but uh, I went on a, a press tour of the seven churches of Asia Minor, uh, mentioned in Revelation, Book of Revelation. And standing in Ephesus, the ruins of Ephesus, and learning more about the history of that place, I came to realize that one of the reasons the Christians were so hated and so persecuted in the early church there was because they resolutely rejected the sexual ideology of the Roman Empire. Um, and not only did they reject it in, in terms of not living by it themselves, but they were trying to convert other people to say, don't live this way. You know, your bodies are worth more than this because it was incredibly exploitative, prostitution, rape of slaves, all of this. Uh, in Acts chapter 19, there was a near riot in Ephesus because a guy named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made um, uh, uh, idols to, to the, to, for pilgrims to the Temple of Artemis to take there, he said, listen, if these Christians keep succeeding, we're going to be out of business. The entire economy was built around this kind of thing. Now, I bring this up here for this reason. I understood why the Christians were so persecuted there, and a lot of it had to do with their view of sex, because it, you know, early Christian sexual morality flew straight in the face of the dominant religion and the dominant economy of the time. Here we are in the 21st century in this post-Christian era, and if you stand uh, on traditional Christian teaching on sexuality, especially homosexuality, transgenderism, and abortion, you are going to be persecuted. That's just how it is. And I'm not saying that gives us license to be nasty, but it does mean we're going to have to be tough and we're going to have to prepare to suffer for the sake of being faithful. That's something that the American church can't stand to hear. But that's something that when I was traveling throughout the former communist countries, talking to people who stay Christians who stayed behind, uh, and and, sir, and uh, lived as dissidents, that's something I heard from them over and over again. Go back to America and tell American Christians, if you're not prepared to suffer, your faith is meaningless. 
I'm interested in your thoughts on like class stratification, especially in the U.S. and how these different, you know, like, for example, I mean, my brother's a welder, so he didn't go to four years of undergraduate school and off to a job where there's an HR department that kind of more or less um, implicitly tells conservatives that, you know, if, if you were to express any of your backwards views or whatever on um, marriage, homosexuality, um, or transgenderism, then, you know, you're, you're going to become a pariah and um, you're not going to have a job anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously that is the case for a lot of different, um, you know, mostly among that cultural elite, um, those types of positions, whether that's like technology or even, you know, I mean, hospitals literally everywhere. So I'm kind of curious what your thoughts are, especially given that um, public opinion has shifted so much, especially since, you know, Obergefell um, on these matters that this like, and I, I, I try to kind of check myself because I admittedly am very online. So I, I in my community, we, we especially, yeah. I go to, yeah, right. I go to a, a Latin mass parish where everyone more or less is on the same wavelength. You know, we all have very, um, our, our views, we try to keep them as close to, you know, the teaching of the church as possible. So how do you see that, you know, maybe just zooming out a little bit in the U.S. playing out over time? Like, it just seems like social conserv or conservatives in general are just they're kind of screwed in that regard. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're totally screwed. Look, I think I'm glad to hear that you go to a Latin mass community because the point of one of the big points of the Benedict option is that Christians need tight community. So we can um, we can be uh, uh, have that support, that spiritual support and material support uh, in living as we do in an aggressively post-Christian world. But um, it's interesting you bring up the class divide. I have three kids. Two, of My two sons are both out of high school. One is just finishing his undergraduate degree, and he's going to go to grad school and work, not in academia, thank God. But he's going to be working whatever he does in a pretty woke workplace. My younger son is in, going to trade school. He's learning to be a welder. And, you know, I, this is what where his gifts were. And I, I come from a working class background. I'm, I was happy to support him so he will go do whatever he's called to do, but I'm secretly really happy that he's not going to have to put up with the kind of garbage that his older brother's going to have to put up with. Nevertheless, um, my younger son is uh, already, I can tell he's starting to intuit how despised his class is, his professional class is in this country by the elites. And uh, he's not a political person at all. He's not even an intellectual, he's a really smart kid, but not an intellectual but he's already absorbing it from the broader culture. And uh, I think that this is just gonna get more and more, gonna get worse and worse. I, we, we've seen, as Elon Musk took over Twitter, we've seen the entire left-wing professional class have a meltdown as if none of them had ever had to talk to anybody who disagreed with them about anything. The thing is, Marlo, these people are the ones who run the institutions and institutional power is massively important. The only, and, and this is a big change for conservatism that, that I've lived through just in my lifetime. I came to, to age politically under in the Reagan years. The only major uh, source or, or, or pushback that, uh, open to conservatives is the state. This is what happened when we had woke, when woke capitalism took over. You know, big business suddenly was on the side of, of the centralizing state. And uh, in terms of pushing what I now call soft totalitarianism, on everybody else. The only thing left to people like us is the state. So for Reagan, for Buckley, for that generation of conservatives, the state was the problem. I think for our generation now, uh, I hate to say the state is a solution, but it's the best thing we have right now. Rod, I think that's a great segue into the, the question on political theology that I had for you. It, but then I think that we, I'm, in order to ask that question, I'm going to rewind with another one of these okay. questions about how things have shifted a bit, um, setting aside the more mainstream kind of winsome approach to the culture and politics. Back in, you know, the early, let's say 2013, 2014, you know, you and I kind of also ran in a lot of the sort of the localist circles, the front porch republic circles, um, and at that period of time, you know, if, if there were groups that identified as post liberals, they were all sort of in the same <clears throat> camp, right? They weren't, there weren't these divides between integralists and, um, 
Yeah, well, there's a million divides now. They've all sort of splintered into these different factions. Mm-hmm. And some of them have, 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 let's say, become much more aggressive in, in what they want in terms of the outcomes through political power. Others have, have nearly totally disengaged or maybe even become a little bit more liberal just because they really are uncomfortable with where the right kind of headed under Trump. Uh, so sort of, I, I'd be curious if you could maybe comment on some of those divides sort of on this localist kind of post-liberal right among our friends. But I think the bigger question is, and this kind of gets to, to something that I think, you know, is maybe in, in these debates between you and some of the integralists, I think, you know, listening to you talk, hearing sort of about the political vision that you want, uh, you know, I really, it, it seems as though, you know, at, at the domestic level, you, you sort of are drawn to a figure like Orban who, you know, functions the way, let's say, a, a Christian emperor might have functioned. They were <laughs> a restrainer of lawlessness at home yeah. and a protector of Christians abroad, right? I think that sort of political theology is, you know, pretty consonant with, let's say, the Byzantine Empire uh, or other perhaps Christian monarchies. But at the same time, you know, you also, with with some frequency, defend religious liberty as sort of the best uh, hope and bastion for Christians today. So I'm wondering if you can just, uh, I know there's a, a distinction too between perhaps your ideal and the prudential. Uh, uh-huh, uh-huh. So maybe on these multiple levels of like what happened to the localists and these various post-liberal groups and also sort of, you know, what do you really see as kind of like the ideal yeah. uh, political theology based on <laughs> where you're at right now? Gosh, well, how much time do we have? Um, you know, I, it is a good question what happened to the localists, because I used to be so much more um, interested in the things they had to say. I, I think that I had hadn't really thought about it, John, until you asked, but I think the the, the rise of wokeness um, just overwhelmed uh, a lot of my own vision and the, the threat coming at everybody from woke institutions and woke culture just took up so much of my attention. And it's also, it, it matters for localists too. And I'll give you an example. Wherever there, the internet is, there is the machine, you know? that there's no retreating into localism from this stuff. I, I was speaking earlier this fall at a pastor's conference for the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod up in Michigan, uh, a bunch of conservative Lutheran pastors. I talked to this one man who had tears in his eyes because his teenage daughter considered herself trans. He said, we live in a town of 300 people and there are two trans teenagers. My daughter's one of them. We raised her in a conservative Christian home how did this happen? Well, it happened because of the smartphone, the way it always happens. So uh, the point is there, any localist ideals have to contend with the universalist, with the globalist fact of, of the internet. And as parents can move wherever they want to, but as long as the internet is there, it makes a difference whether you're in New York City or rural Michigan. The, the monster is gonna get your kids if you're not careful. Um, as far as the political theology goes, you know, one of the things that is interesting about Orban, and this is something they can do in Hungary that we can't really do in America, because the Hungarian constitution affirms that Hungary is a Christian nation. Um, Hungary is 75% Catholic, 25% uh, Calvinist. Orban himself is a Calvinist, as is uh, the president, Katlin Novak. And Calvinists and, and Catholics get along pretty well here, and they... Orban has enough sense to realize that prudentially they need to work together, you know, because so much of the political energy comes from the Calvinists themselves. Uh, uh, they, they punch well above their weight here in Hungary. I think in the U.S., though, I, I have really run afoul of the integralist. I mean, uh, some of those guys just seem to love to um, to be pugilistic in, that, in the way Doug Wilson does out in Moscow, Idaho. They they. Um, they don't play well with others, and you know that's that that's their prerogative. But I don't understand it because if you want a Catholic confessional state in the United States, where Catholics are a minority, uh, and where I guarantee you, ninety-nine out of a hundred Catholics would not want to return, would not want integralism, then you're going to have to make friends and allies. And uh, they, they, I just don't understand why they do the things they do. 
any case, I, I think integralism, Catholic integralism, is a no-go in America. But so would so whatever Protestant equivalent would be. People like Stephen Wolf, the case for Christian nationalism, um, they're not going to get that either because most Americans just don't want a confessional state. So where does that leave us? Uh, I think that um, it is not ideal to live in the, the old-fashioned uh, classical liberal idea of religious liberty and pluralism, but it's all we have. And uh, I, I, every time I try to think outside of that framework, which is a really dissatisfying framework in many ways, I, I come up with nothing. I feel like that if we, as our country becomes more and more secular, more and more post-Christian, and um, y'all's generation is going to be the first one where I think it's going to be where a majority of people will not be affiliated with any Christian tradition. Um, it's going to be harder and harder for faithful Christians to keep our keep our foot in the public square. So I think that uh, we don't have, from a prudential matter, we don't have a choice other than to lean hard into First Amendment uh, traditional American religious liberty pluralism, uh, and. But that's that's because we're just that that's just the history of American the American Constitution and the diversity of American life. At the same time, we we can't expect there to be a strong Christian or Christian friendly government without people who actually practice the faith. Here in Hungary, um, it's the government is strongly Christian in its ideology, but you don't have a lot of Hungarians, Protestant or Catholic, going to church on Sunday. Uh, I was I got into a friendly debate with a Hungarian uh, politician friend of mine who is a non-practicing Catholic, and he said, "Look, why isn't it enough for us to just defend Christian culture? You know, let that be good enough." I said, "Well, it's better than nothing, but you're not going to have that Christian culture for long if you don't have actual worshiping Christians uh, in Poland, uh, which is one of Hungary's big regional allies. Every time I go there, Johnny, and this is your homeland, your family's homeland." Uh, young Catholics, Catholics in their 20s who go to church and who believe what the church teaches all tell me this country is going to go the same way of Ireland within 10, 20 years max. I find that so difficult to believe because I came of age in the John Paul II generation, but it's really true. The young people there are becoming completely uh, evangelized, so to speak, by social media. They are falling away in massive numbers from Christianity, and that is going to be an immense problem politically in that country. You can't have a Christian society or a Christian state without worship, without Christians who go to church and who really believe that. And this is another reason that I, I'm behind the Benedict option, just to, store, to shore up our faith, uh, our, our commitment to what we say we believe, our, uh, our, our practices, our spiritual disciplines, so we can, we can remain Christian as the world becomes ever more against us. Yeah, actually, uh, on that note, today's the feast day of Our Lady Guadalupe, and I was thinking yesterday, mm -hmm. like, Europe or the Americas could use a Marian apparition to kind of shore up the faith <laughs> a little bit, but um, I, I know something that I've I mean, just unrelated question, um, well, related, but unrelated to that comment. Um, I know like some more, you know, populist leaning um, US politicians such as Josh Hawley have remarked on the need for a, you know, working class, multi-ethnic, you know, solidarity um, between, you know, people, perhaps people of different faiths, but united around, you know, opposing wokeness and, and some of these other more nefarious elements. And there was this video, um, just going around on Twitter a few weeks ago, and it showed in Dearborn, Michigan, which is, for those listening who aren't aware, has the largest population of Arab Americans um, in the country uh, as far as uh, per capita, um, or, you know, just, I know there's a lot throughout the rest of the country, but that's pretty much kind of the capital of, um, of it in the U.S. And um, there was this father and just surrounded by, so a lot of, you know, Muslims in the area, um, and there was this father at the school board meeting who was telling the school board, like, you are the enemy. You are teaching our children just absolute garbage. He was remarking on, like, um, I guess there was a book that had some really grotesque, inappropriate uh, oh, yeah. sexual imagery for children. Yeah, just totally horrific. Horrifying. And, I know the book. Yeah, yeah. And he, he, he was, you know, th this video was going around and it made me think, like, is, is it possible perhaps for, you know, these parents who... Um, these Muslim parents who are culturally very conservative and 
would perhaps, you know, walk hand in hand with American Christians who are also conservative and, you know, perhaps also American Jews as well who are also conservative in opposition to what's happening in schools at the very least. Do you see that happening on a larger scale despite, you know, kind of declining population or declining, you know, uh, faith in the U.S. among, you know, all all these groups or yeah. is that kind of a fever dream or, you know, no, no, no. I, it has to happen, Marlo. It really has to happen. Um, I I'm reminded of a something that a friend of mine who is a Christian college administrator in California told me a few years ago after a, the Burkerfield decision um, constitutionalizing same sex marriage. The head of the LGBT caucus in the California state legislature uh, uh, introduced a bill that would have meant that Cal grants, these are direct student grants, state grants to needy students that they could use at any accredited state institution, private or public, uh, for their college education. Under the bill, the Cal grants would not be allowed to be used at so-called bigot schools, that is to say um, schools that don't you know, that, that hold to traditional views of um, of, of gay marriage and, and LGBT, uh, which is, and what this would have done, it would have meant that uh, more than a hundred small Christian institutions would have either had to violate their conscience by changing their teaching, or shut down because they were so dependent on this. So my friend uh, is an administrator at one of these colleges. He went with a, a group of other college administrators to Orange County, which is the you know, the, the big uh, suburban evangelical uh, uh, promised land in California. They went around to mega church pastors, white mega church pastors. Every pastor they talked to agreed with them that this is a threat. We hope you, you fight it back. But not one of those pastors would dare stand publicly with them because they were terrified of being called bigots. My friend said the only way they only reason they beat this legislation back was because black Pentecostal pastors in South Central L.A. and the Latino Catholic Archbishop of Los Angeles spoke out. If this doesn't tell you something uh, about what's needed right now, I don't know what what can you have so many middle class people, middle class white people who are terrified of being thought bigots or, or, or losing social status. Uh, the other day in the Wall Street Journal, um, Kevin Stewart, a friend of mine who teaches political science in Austin, had this really interesting piece about his small town, uh, an exurb of Austin, Texas, um, Taylor, Texas, and about how they suddenly have an, uh, a drag queen Christmas float in their tiny town. And it happened, uh, to, to get to the point of his column, it happened because small town people didn't expect that it would happen. It would come there, and they were so afraid to stand up against the experts in town who are saying, we have to have this, we have to have this. I think that this is the problem, that so many normies think that if we just keep our heads down, the bad stuff is going to go away. Uh, Orthodox priest I know, I was trying to talk to him a few years ago about, um, about gender ideology. I said, how are you preparing your congregation for this? Oh, we don't talk about it, he said. Like, what do you mean you don't talk about it? It's everywhere. The kids are getting this. As well, uh, we just uh, we just feel like that this is something this is somebody else's problem. I'm like it's going to be your problem. It is your problem right now, whether you see it or not. You know, he said. Well, I think if we just keep coming to church and keep saying our prayers, everything's going to be fine. That's a guy who's a coward. That's a guy who will not wake up and see what time it is. So Christians who do see what time it is should partner with Muslims, with Orthodox Jews, with atheists, with anybody who is willing to find the courage to stand up to this garbage. When I was in, um, in Prague doing reporting for my book, Live Not By Lies, about the, the Christian dissidents under communism, I asked Camilla Bendova. She and her late husband, Václav, were the only Christians inside the inner circle of dissidents around Václav Havel. I said, How was, it, was it difficult for you and your husband as very strict Catholics to work with these hippies, these atheist hippies? Uh, in the resistance. She told me, no, not at all. It was easy because they all had the one thing that you need more than anything else when you're fighting this kind of totalitarianism. They had courage. She said, Rod, mustn't think that Christians in this country had the courage to stand up. Most of them did what everybody else did. They kept their head down to try to avoid trouble. So uh, she advised me, whenever you find people who have the courage to stand up in public and be counted and not live by lies, you go make an ally of those people because you're going to need each other. 
Rod, we have just a minute or two left. I'm wondering, in closing, uh, if you could uh, give a brief summary. I know you're working on a book project. You've been traveling to a lot of holy places throughout Europe and the Middle East. I'm wondering if you could share a little bit about what you're working on. Yeah, I, I'm doing a book about re-enchantment from a Christian point of view. What do I mean by re-enchantment? I'm not talking about sprinkling fairy dust like in Disney World or anything like that. I mean it in the sense that uh, Max Weber, the famed sociologist, said that the modern world is disenchanted. We no longer believe in religion. We know, People no longer believe that there is meaning inherent in the material world, that sort of thing. Well, I, I think that's not true. I mean, you and I, Johnny, are, are Eastern Orthodox. We believe as we pray that God is everywhere present and fills all things. This um, the disenchantment is a disease of modernity. I think it is false. That uh, And what I'm trying to do is figure out how we can open our eyes to what is really there, which would require going back to rediscover the metaphysics of Christianity of the first millennium that all Christians shared. It's a sacramental vision uh, for sure, but uh, it's not going to be a strictly religious book. I've been deeply into the, um, the work of Ian McGilchrist. He is a, a psychiatrist and an author who lives in Scotland. He wrote this fantastic book. It's about this thing called The Matter with Things, it's like uh, thousands of pages. But he, it's a completely secular account of, of consciousness and the material world. And what he basically argues for is to say that the materialist view is wrong, that there is mystery embedded within matter. Now, Johnny, this sounds so incredibly abstract and weird, but what I'm also doing is talking to people, ordinary people, who have had encounters with the numinous, they've gone to holy places, they've had been miraculously healed, They've had visions of angels and saints of the Virgin Mary. Um, and I'm also just tomorrow morning, I'm going down to Rome to talk to an exorcist at the Vatican because that that is part of enchantment too. It's a negative kind of enchantment. And I want people to understand there are places that we must not go. Just this past summer when I was in, uh, I was in Oxford, I met a young man, 27 years old from London, who was studying to be an Anglican priest. And he told me that before he uh, went to seminary, he worked in advertising in London at a very high level at a at a top uh, bureau. He said, "You know, I, I'm the I was the only uh, Christian in the office. No surprise there." He said, "But there were no atheists. Every other person in the office was involved at some level with the occult, and a couple of people were open Satanists." He said, "This is this is the challenge of my generation." To new atheism is dead, dead, dead. People are desperate for transcendence. But because they don't find it in a lot of Christian churches, they're going to the occult. They're going to psychedelic drugs. They're finding all kinds of other avenues to to touch the transcendent. And, uh, and they're losing their souls that way. What I'm doing at this book is trying to find authentic Christian ways of doing it. And, uh, man, I tell you, the treasures that all of us, especially we Christians in the sacramental tradition, Orthodox and Catholic, the treasures we have all around us, they're here. We just have to open our eyes and help people to see what God has already given us. That's what I'm hoping to do with this book. Well, thank you so much again for joining us today, Rod, and, and telling us a little bit about what is in store for the future as far as your writing goes. Is there anywhere else that we can perhaps, um, obviously tack um, the American conservative, mm -hmm. we can read your works, but is there anywhere else that you are appearing or that our, our listeners can follow you at? Sure. I'm on Twitter at Rod Dreher, one word, R-O-D-D-R-E-H-E-R. -E and I write a Substack, uh, too, a subscriber only. It's a paid Substack. I charge the minimum I have to for it. But that's where I do a lot of my spiritual writing, things that I don't quite feel comfortable writing at a secular place like TAC, though it's very Christian friendly. But I'm workshopping my book there. I've got a lot of subscribers. I write, I don't know, twice a week, sometimes three times a week. Let them know what I'm reading, what I'm thinking, where I'm traveling. And uh, I, uh, I really enjoy the community that I built up there. Um, I, I have people who aren't even Christians who subscribe because people are so hungry for some deep discussion about spiritual realities. And I try to give it to them at rodreer.substack.com. Great. Thanks again, Rod. Thank you. And Merry Christmas to everybody. Thank you for listening to Conservative Conversations with ISI. If you 
enjoy this podcast, please feel free to head over to isi.org slash resources to see all that we offer our members, including the intercollegiate review, select modern age articles, ISI books, and of course, this podcast. Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to rate and review, and we will see you next time on Conservative Conversations with ISI.